Hey everybody, my name is Jim Farmer. I'm the festival director of Album Film. Thanks for joining us tonight. This is our 34th year of presenting stories for, by, and about our community and its allies. This is our first hybrid festival. Um, you can see films in theater and you can see films virtually as well. Uh, many of those have Q and A's attached to those like the one we're doing tonight. So the film that we're doing tonight is Raw, Uncut Video. I'm gonna read a brief description of the film and then we're gonna have some questions for our co-directors. Raw Uncut Video is a love story about fetish porn. It chronicles the rise and fall of homegrown gay porn studio Palm Drive Video and explores how a devoted couple helped battle a devastating health crisis by promoting kinky sex. I have the, and let me just say, I, I, this film is, I, I love this film. It's, it's, just, it's just so fascinating. Uh, we have the co-directors of this film, Ryan White and Alex Closen. So um, thank you much for joining us and you know, thanks for being here. Thanks for having us. Yes, thank you. Very excited to be part of Out on Film. Thanks so much. Well now, I mean, what made you want to tell this story? Um, I mean, that's an interesting story. It just was something that kind of fell in our lap, to be honest. Um, Alex and I were working on another film project, a short film about kind of cruising up on the Russian River area of California, where we were both living at the time. And mm -hmm. through that project, we met Jack Fritcher and Mark Henry, his husband. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, we kind of got to know them a little bit. And, you know, we were just asking about stuff on the, you know, on in that particular area, like, you know, the it, men that they were aware of who'd been part of particular scenes. And they said, oh, well, we shot some movies in the 80s with some <laughs> local guys, maybe you're interested. And so they sent us home with a stack of DVDs uh, and it was, what was it, Alex? Do you remember? It was um, uh, like Belly Bucker and, and Toilet uh, Cigar Butt. You know, toilet Cigar Butt. And Alex and I didn't know what we were getting into. Uh, <laughs> And we end up with these these videos, these Palm Drive videos, and we both went, holy shit, uh, there's something here. And so we started talking to Jack and Mark uh, more about what they did, and it just kind of grew from there. Uh, and ultimately, it took us five years to make the film. Well, I imagine those DVDs are pretty extinct right now, the ones they gave you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, they yes, haven't. We still have, I still have them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they haven't distributed in a long time, and it's certainly not, you know, they just decided to stop producing it as they kind of mentioned in the film. Exactly. Well, there's so much to ask, but can you just, I mean, Jack was instrumental in getting drummer off their, can you just sort of talk about the importance of drummer and, and how it really helped and shaped the gay community, especially in identity? Alex, do you want to? Sure. Oh, sure. Well, I think drummer, like, uh, I think as, as, as is mentioned in the film, I think by Peter Fisk, like drummer really gave the leather, it was a bit of a voice for the leather community. And, and sure. Jack would talk about going out and sort of recording what he saw and really helping, you know, the queer community know more about the leather community mm -hmm. um, and just giving sense of just like, this is what's going on and this is what you can, you know, this is what you can try out. I mean, it's a bit like Palm Drive, like talking mm -hmm. about um, uh, di different distribution, of course, since Drummer was a magazine um, and Palm Drive was video, but really getting that information out there for, you know, ways for people to explore their, their kinks and fetishes. So when, when Palm Drive video eventually began, I mean, how long did it take before it was just, was it, was popular and well-known enough that these guys could really just do this full time? I mean, that's the thing is Jack and Mark never, I mean, it was a full-time job, but they both had quote unquote real jobs, exactly. right? So this was something that they did, Palm Drive was something that they did in their, in their extra time. Okay. Uh, and um, and and I, I don't know, you know, to be honest, if it ever became so popular, it was always mail order, right? It was yeah. always like, I mean, this is pre-internet, right? I mean, you got a, you saw an ad in Drummer Magazine and it had a list of titles, right? You didn't even see still images. You just saw Daddy's Beer Belly and Bondage, right? You know, Toilet Cigar Butt you know, belly bucker, you know, and it's like, and you're just going through and ordering saying, hey, that sounds like something that's interesting to me. 
Um, so it was a very niche market in a lot of ways, but it also, I think, filled a need, you know, it filled a need and it allowed people this opportunity to kind of explore and say, hey, this is something that I've maybe never thought about before, but hey, it's hot, it gets me off. Like, this is exciting. Maybe I need to expand a little, my, my own kind of sexual persona a little bit more. Sure. Um, so I feel like that was really the importance of Palm Drive, one of the important things. It, it, it just, it's fascinating to me because, you know, I was obviously around back during that time, but you know, you think now, how did life happen without the internet? How did, how did we live without the internet? How, how do we, I mean, and when you think about, you know, this video company starting with no ability to have a website or, or, or anything like that, it's just fascinating how existed then. But was it, I mean, was it, was it, obviously they did have full-time jobs during the day, but how long before you, before it actually just took off, before people, before they were doing this, it became really busy and people knew about it or ordering pretty efficiently. Hmm. I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I know that. I mean, Ryan, would you make a guess? I, mean, I, I would say early nineties, right? Okay. You know, so they started in 1985, yeah. um, you know, uh, with some pretty, you know, pretty kind of, low budget fetishy kind of stuff by 92 93 they started having enough clout to bring in you know known performers so mm -hmm. like mickey squires the blake twins uh chris duffy donnie russo right so it was kind of like mid 90s things were really starting to take off for them but then what's interesting and this is also discussed in the film is that's also when jack and mark almost started losing interest a little bit right, is when they started having these professional models come in and the professional models coming from other porn shoots had certain expectations. It wasn't about exploring themselves sexually, it was about the paycheck, right, yeah. or about the sort of narcissism potentially involved in, in being a, you know, a performer. So, um, and I think that that's where Jack and Mark really kind of started losing interest is when they moved away from what they would call just real guys, you know, that they would find in bathrooms or hitchhiking or yeah. at the county fair, right? That's how Palm Drive started. Um, but so as it got more popular, they started bringing in more known performers, but that's also when kind of the Palm Drive energy started fizzling, at least for them. I mean, at the time, I mean, um... What, what 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 were the alternatives in, in terms of other pornography that was out there? I mean, I, mean, I, I guess was Falcon around at that time? Had, had Falcon sort of reached its pinnacle around throughout the time? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I mean, it, it was just it's such a fascinating because I mean, Palm Drive used blue color man, and that was that was definitely not what Falcon was promoting at the time. It was definitely different. But can I mean, can you just talk about? I mean, obviously you're not Jack and Mark, but can you talk about their decision to? to not use the Falcon type and go after the real man, the blue collar and how they're eventually just, just proved to be an audience for that. Well, I think it was, you know, it, it was partially their interests. Like they, you know, as they talk about in the film, like they really just, part of it was just, they wanted to make what they wanted to watch mm -hmm. and like what, what their friends would like to watch. And I think, you know, having, moved to Sonoma County, like there was this whole sort of untapped wealth of um, men to potentially use, you know, outside of San Francisco where they were before. Um, so I think it was really just started as that, just like, we want to make what we want to see. Sure. Okay. I, I watched the film again earlier, and, and there's a mention that um, before Stonewall, people did not talk about fetishes. Um, I mean, why would you say that is? And, and what changed that, that allowed people to be more upfront about their fetishes and what they what was of interest to them? Yeah, I mean, I think as people became, you know, like, I mean, and still we're dealing with this, right? I and mean, I think feel, people sure. still are challenged by sort of claiming certain identities sometimes, mm -hmm. right? You know? Um, and sexual identities are one of those identities that are very personal, right? You know, it's like, it's very personal to say, I like feet, or I like chubby guys, or I like bondage, or I like that. It, I mean, it's like, these are things we don't necessarily talk about necessarily in an open conversation all the time. So I think that, you know, kind of with gay liberation and kind of 
queer rights kind of growing, like by the 80s, there was kind of more of this space to say, hey, I identify with this, right? This is part of me, like there's my, my identity and there's my sexual identity. Right. And sexual cultures, I feel like, especially during the AIDS crisis, started becoming more important. Right. And that, you know, maybe it be goes beyond just sort of penetrative sex. Right. You could start identifying as a bear. Right. Or as a, you know, somebody into kind of certain kinks or whatnot. And so I think it's just like with anything, it just takes time for people to kind of be comfortable. And I, I think and, and, and saying those things and claiming those things openly. Um, so, I mean, that's what I, and I think we're not even there yet, right? For a lot of folks, it's still, you know, it's still a lot to say, hey, I, I, I am, you know, this, I have this particular sexual identity. Exactly. Another fascinating element of the film is that, um, you know, a lot of this parallels, you know, AIDS and, and, and a lot of people, the fear a lot of people had back then that by having sex, they were going to die, that they could not have sex. But, you know, these videos really promoted sex positivity and show that you can have sex again. And but can you just sort of talk about that element of this, one of you? Well, certainly uh, Jack and Mark talked about it, like, you know, their reasoning for making film, not just to, uh, you know, see films that they, that they wanted to see, mm -hmm. but also just like, to help people explore their sexuality in a safe way. And I think that was a, really at the beginning, like th there was actually footage of Jack talking about those very things, which was really kind of great to find in the archive to, to find like the goal of Palm Drive. One of the goals was really to, to help people explore, explore things safely and, you know, keep, keep their sexuality going and when, you know, they would be scared to, you know, have sex with people. Sure. As part of, I mean, how extensive was the research that you did in terms of, you know, going through videos and talking to people? Well, I mean, what was, what was your research like? And going through archives? So, I mean, we were really lucky in terms of an archivally based project. I mean, yeah. because Mark and Jack have spent a lot of time digitizing and archiving their own collection. Right. Mm -hmm. So essentially, uh, Mark handed us a hard drive and it had all the Palm Drive films digitized, as well as all the behind the scenes footage. So like the camera originals. Right. So there was hundreds of hours of material. Now, we needed to go. I mean, the, the, the edited films were interesting to us because they were, the, they were what was released. But it was the unedited kind of camera originals that were the most interested, interesting to us because that's where there were these kind of, you got the behind the scenes, you know, like the behind the scenes stuff. You got conversations between Jack and Donnie Russo, conversations between Mark and, you know, Mickey Squires or whatever, or where you get those little moments that, you know, kind of help to tell the story beyond just what was it put out, edited and put out there into the world. But so we probably had, I don't know, I, I want to say at least 300 hours of material just to sort through. So we had we had a, an amazing um, associate producer that we worked with, Haley Gilchrist, and they helped us kind of organize. We had like a spreadsheet going and it was like, what's on this tape? Which characters are on this tape? You know, what, you know, what's beyond kind of just, you know, sex stuff, what is interesting about this tape? And so we, I mean, that was kind of a big process was just keeping ourselves organized so that we could find that material, identify which characters we wanted to highlight in the film, and then find like, you know, again, that kind of magic behind the scenes footage that helped us to demonstrate what Jack and Mark were up to. Sure. I mean, when, when you, is there a lot of other material that you might, would perhaps put on a, like a DVD commentary or, or other material that you would put streaming at some point? Yeah, there's so much. I mean, there's stuff in the archive we haven't watched yet. <laughs> it's such a dense, like, I mean, their full archive, you know, not just the Palm Drive stuff, but, you know, like everything around it, like all their, the hard copies of brochures, like their layouts, and then everything else that they've collected too, like j j all the stuff from Drummer that Jack had and, you know, other producers from the time. Um, it's just, just a crazy collection. So sure. huge. As you were doing your research, were there some fetishes that you did not, that surprised you that you just simply didn't know about? Uh, yeah, for sure. 
for sure. I making this film, I really realized how vanilla I actually am. <laughs> uh, you know, and Alex and I had a lot of conversations about that, right? Where it was like, whoa, puke porn, like not for me, but I'm glad it's out there, right? Um, you know, so there was definitely some things, you know, that were kind of that pushed my limits. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know when I was, but then I think also just when you kind of approach that stuff as an archive, as history that's important, right? As, as something that we're using to tell a story, it also became very normalized, I think, for both of us. Um, and that was one thing that was really interesting is I would be editing uh, in my editing studio at home and my husband would come in and he'd be like, what the fuck are you watching? And <laughs> Like, you know, just a little mud fucking, you know, and he would, he would just kind of like slowly close the door and be like, okay, we'll talk about it at dinner. <laughs> so I, I've got a story for you when we, when we, when we stop this recording. Anyway. Um, so obviously palm drop video for a lot of men was, was very liberating to show that, that you're not alone, that you, there, there's, you, you can see yourself, you know, on, on, on in this um and it reached a lot of people it affected a lot of people it made them you know appreciate their sexuality but what was there a stigma that that came along with this from was there any kind of stigma that came attached to what they were doing and the kind of product that they were releasing um do you mean in in, in terms of like uh people not comfortable with fetish exactly um, I think that, you know, I think probably <laughs> I don't I don't recall any specific stories from Jack about, you know, people being up in arm like from the queer community. But, you know, they certainly had issues with the government, um, you know, where they could ship things um, and, you know, the, the whole Mies Commission, uh, like just during that time, it was challenging, you know. Uh, for artists and certainly for for pornographers at the time, um, but specifically, I'm not I'm not sure of if they had issues with the queer community at all. Sure, yeah, I was just kind of curious because obviously, you know, Falcon, you know, reached the mainstream, but Falcon was also pretty pretty vanilla. So I was just wondering if there was any kind of stigma that they this they the two faced because of the, you know what they were releasing. Is there anything? Um, what would you consider, what is the nearest equivalent to the kind of product that Palm Drive Video put out? What, what, is, what is similar these days? Is there anything that, that sort of comes close to what they were doing? I mean, Pornhub and, yeah. uh, you know, OnlyFans and, mm -hmm. you know, all those. Guys. I mean, I think, you know, Jack and Mark talk about that a little bit, you know, about, you know, they in some ways were all when what Palm Drive was doing, and it should be noted also that there were other small boutique companies at the time, right? There was David Hurls and Old Reliable, there was Close Up, there was Bob Jones, you know, there was other like small mail order uh, uh, porn companies. Um, but with them doing this solo thing, right? And this kind of, you know, breaking the fourth wall, like the, the performers speaking directly to the viewer, um, I mean, Jack sees it as a correlation to kind of, again, to, to kind of homemade, homemade porn that we see online all the time, right? You know, the solo jerk off videos or, you know, just kind of, ex you know, exhibitionists at home doing whatever it is, whatever kink that they like to explore and making those kind of very homemade videos and uploading them, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, now hopefully making some money off of it with something like OnlyFans. You know, but, um, but yeah, that's, that would be where I see the, the kind of current uh, parallel. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about, you have some remarkable interviews in the documentary, can you talk a little bit about the people that you chose to interview and, and you know, just getting them to be part of this? Well, I think certainly like the interview that always comes to mind for me is um, Thrasher and his mom. Sure. Um, and at first he was, pretty reluctant to participate, but mm -hmm. um, Jack and Mark are still, you know, still were in touch with Susan and she was gung ho. And she, thankfully she convinced him to do it. So we were really lucky because that, 
that was some unexpected magic. I mean, we knew we were going to record the two of them together, but sort of what came out of that was really remarkable. Um, just like what an ally Susan is. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, obviously. As for other performers, sorry, as for other performers, a lot of it was going through the archive, sure. seeing where, again, when we go back to that spreadsheet and all, all, we're trying to keep it track of everything, seeing where there was actually stories, right? You know, and where also folks were still, who was still alive, right? A lot of the performers didn't survive the AIDS crisis. So, um, so like Donnie Russo was somebody that's still around and is a known, you know, porn star. Mm -hmm. uh, Nikki Squires saying, you know, uh, Steve Parker, you know, so there was a certain element of like, you know, trying to find those people that had a little bit of a name and had a bit of a story that we could kind of tell from within that archive uh, okay. that kind of helped, helped guide us to who we were going to focus on. Okay. Uh, obviously, COVID threw a wrench into <laughs> everything last year and this year but I mean when did you film this and, and did COVID have any effect on when you were getting this out to the world? Well luckily uh, for us the majority of the filming was done prior to COVID so I, I, I think Ryan spent most of the the first year of COVID mm -hmm. editing you know and we would have virtual meetings and all that uh, lots of discussions but um you know, the timing just worked out that way. Yeah. I think our last official shoot was like January, 2019, or maybe, or sorry, uh, uh, December, 2019 or January, 2020. I mean, we, I mean, the timing was kind of good on our side with COVID. Yeah. Have you, have you, so much of what's going on now is, is virtual screening. We're talking about that a little bit, but have you had a chance to see this with an audience yet? Oh, nice. Yes. When, when was your premiere? Uh, in person, sure. that would be, we went to um, Molodis uh, in Ukraine, which was really phenomenal, unexpected and phenomenal. Sure. Um, just to be able to, see, like, that was the first time we were able to see it with, with people. And it was, um, we were a little concerned about being in such a different, place culturally um would things translate uh but the the response was was great unexpected but great nice I, I we love recently screened in person at uh the director's guild in la at oh, Fest, nice. which was also great nice i i love that you know at, at least the the descriptions of the film called this a love story because it is a love story about the, these two guys who who you know were together and did this and, and and you know I just can you just talk sort of talk about the fact that you know for all the for all the stuff that goes on in the film you know the mud you know the, the, it's basically a love story about these two men and I think that that's something that stuck out to us early on right was that uh, so much of what drew us in was Jack and Mark right, with getting to know Jack and Mark, and also to look at them, and they're, you know, they've been together for 40 plus years, you know, um, they, they started dating the year I was born, you know, and so, and then, so just thinking about, thinking about, like, them also using, you know, kind of both, kind of claiming these identities, right, and being like, this is who we are, and then using, the palm drive in a way to kind of survive sure. the, the AIDS crisis, you know, because I always think that, you know, I always think, and it was actually Rick Castro, photographer who's in the film, kind of pointed out that, you know, at that time, a lot of photographers, a lot of filmmakers, their camera became their penis, essentially, right? So Jack's ability to kind of bring these men in and explore their fantasies with them was also Jack and Mark's way of continuing to have their own erotic personalities, right? And their own erotic exploration, but with this distance between the performer and then the camera in the middle and then Jack on the other end. Right. And so um, and I, I feel like, you know, for me, at least that that relationship between Jack and Mark and, you know, I think there's kind of a misconception that kinky folks are not able to have love or are not able to have sustainable long term relationships. And that's clearly not the case. 
right? And even though, you know, Jack and Mark are kind of, you know, uh, probably did some things that's a lot of people that watch the movie are like, oh my gosh. But it's like, at the end of the day, it came down to the two of them and it came down to their relationship and them weathering this storm together and still trying to kind of be sexual beings and sexual explorers, um, you know, in the midst of a, of, a, of a pandemic. Sure. Have they seen the film yet? Yeah. Okay. What, how, I mean, I'm assuming they liked the film. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Do you, I mean, would you say that this film, this documentary goes away, goes toward giving them their due or do you think they've already received their due? Mm, that's a good question. I mean, Jack is just a, like, cannot stop, like, producing. Like, he's always been writing, you know, during Palm Drive, it was photography and film. And since Palm Drive, I mean, they're still working together constantly to produce things. Like, Jack is a you know, always, it almost seems like a book a year at least, <laughs> like voluminous, um, you know, documents about about queer history. So I, I think that it's a step towards giving him his due, their due, I think. Okay. Um, how long have you two been working together? Let's see, probably about, uh, I mean, we've been friends for a while, but um, I think we first started collaborating maybe 2014. Um, that sounds about right. 2014, 2015. Yeah. This is certainly our first feature together. I mean, what was that like? I mean, having worked together, but this obviously, this is your first feature and this is, this is a very detailed, but what was it like moving into a documentary working together? Uh, well, this is all new to me, so <laughs> um, it was like working with Ryan was great, like a great teacher. Um, sorry, Ryan, you had to have another student, <laughs> but um, it was it was really because I, I um, my background is art, like fine art, like drawing, painting, that okay. kind of thing. So it was a wonderful way to explore a new mode of um, creativity. Uh, working with someone and working with a good friend and and we have a good working rapport uh, which is also nice that it's 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 been pretty easy hopefully for you Ryan <laughs> yeah. yeah I mean for, definitely because for me I, I have made some films before and, yeah. you know I feel like at some point in your life you realize that you know you can't do everything yourself Mm -hmm. uh, and I've often been a one person filmmaker. Uh, and so having Alex on board, I feel like we really filled it like, you know, everybody has their own strengths and weaknesses, right? And so I feel like together, I feel like we made a much stronger film than if I had done this on my own. And Alex really has some strengths that I don't have um, and kind of helped to kind of fill in those, those my weaknesses and kind of, so I feel like we really were a good team. Nice. So final question, what is next for the film and what is next for both of you? Uh, the film is plugging along on the festival circuit. So it's going to New York, it's going to New Fest, it's playing a bunch of dates in, uh, in Europe, which is exciting. So a bunch of European screenings. Um, a bunch of those festivals haven't announced yet, so I'm not sure I'm allowed to say. Okay. Although Gaze is one of them. It's going to Ireland. It's going to be playing at the Irish Film Institute oh, no. uh, in a couple of weeks, so that's exciting. Unfortunately, we won't be able to go. Um, and then in terms of what's next for us, we are developing a project. I'm developing a project. Um, and then Alex is kind of, you know, we're, we're kind of feeling out if it's something that we want to kind of really collaborate on. Um, I don't want to say too much about it because I'm a little bit um, superstitious, but it is, it does involve pornography. <laughs> and it does involve uh, kind of uh, looking at, at pornography from a historical perspective and, um, and kind of considering how especially queer porn kind of helps to fill in some gaps in our history uh, because queer porn tends to, you know, be some of the only documentation, especially as we go back to say the seventies and eighties, so it tends to be some of the only documentation of certain cultures and sexual and otherwise. So, um, so yeah. Okay. And you, Alex? 
Um, just because uh, working on the film has been, um, you know, five years. Uh, so getting back a little bit to some of my other artwork, um, but also certainly in conversation with Ryan about where this where this new project might head. Okay. Congratulations. Um, I, I really, really like this documentary, documentary so much. The documentary is raw, uncut video. It is playing as part of Adult Film this year, both in theater and streaming. And um, thank you both for making this film and for taking the time to talk to us. I really appreciate it. Thanks so right, much. Well, thank you. You have a great evening. Thanks you so too. much. You too. Take, Take care. care.